right. Can you guys all hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So Kerry reminded me that he wasn't going to be able to attend today's meeting. Um, so I believe I'm vice chair, so that means I'll have to take over chair duties. Uh, can you remind me, now that we've had Diane not on the board, how many do we have on our board? Because I want to make sure we've got quorum here. Yep. I, I believe that means that there are six board members. And so I guess, what does that mean? You would need four? Yeah. Yes. So trying to look through here. I see Tim, Dr. Barris, myself. Am I missing anyone? No, I only see three people, three board members right now. Who else would we have coming in yet? If Carrie's not here, that leaves. Um, uh, Cindy Chicker and let's see, uh, Van Nelson. Right, okay. Well, I'll give them a few minutes here and hopefully, I hadn't heard from anybody else that they weren't gonna make it. So hopefully we'll get quorum. Yeah, I, I, don't, I have not either. I don't know, Angie, sometimes people, nope. Oh, okay. Apologize for the delay, everybody. Do you, um, does anyone have contact information for maybe Cindy? I, I can look up Vans. I probably do. Maybe that's somebody on right now. I have a phone number for Cindy. Would you want me to try to call her or? Yeah, do you mind? Thank you. Sure. That would be great. One of my coworkers gave me the ultimate dad joke book here. I could just start reading from if we have time to kill. That'd be great. Well, let me see where I where I open up to. How many trees, or sorry, how many apples grow on a tree? All of them. <laughs> I was gonna say all of them. I better put that away. <laughs> well, and that's only if it's an apple tree, right? I mean, what it, you True. know, it's good clarification. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so I just got a hold of Van, and he's not able to attend. Um, I missed. Is okay. Megan looks like she's on the phone right now. I totally missed the joke, Tim. I was on the phone. <laughs> you, you didn't miss much, really. I, I can catch you up afterwards. So Tracy, if we have to postpone, do we wind up postponing that until next month? It doesn't have to be. I mean, the board could decide that you're going to meet just on a different day. Was there anything on this agenda that needed to go to county board this month? Uh, we do have some contract approvals. Um, oh, Megan's. So I just got out with Cindy. 
um, she's going to log on quick. She thought the meeting was next week. So um, she's going to come on real quick. However, she does have to work a shift at the test site at um, 1130. So she's going to have to pop off at about quarter after. So, but I, we figure if you can hop on for at least a little bit, if, we, if there's anything pressing that we need to right. get so done, then we can maybe. Perhaps then, Tracy, whichever, maybe we put those things at the top of the agenda then. Um, okay. And then we just get through what we can. I believe it's really just the agenda item number nine that requires our board approval. So it typically we have to go through the mon number eight first before, okay. Yeah, that, that certainly would kind of inform you better. Okay. The short agenda maybe we'll get done before Cindy needs to leave too, but. <laughs> right? And I guess other board members, maybe you're more familiar. If we're not actually voting on anything, we still have to have quorum vote to hold the meeting. Is that correct? I think so. Okay.
wonder if Cindy's having trouble. I see Megan's on the phone. She's nodding yes, so I guess so. Okay, <laughs> well, looking like we might need to postpone this meeting. We'll wait till she gets off. <clears throat> I'm working on getting her. <laughs> no problem. She's trying it again, so. Is she logging in on computer or phone? She's gonna try it on her um, personal iPad now, because I guess she's having issues with her other one, and if that doesn't work, she's gonna try calling in, so. <laughs> okay. Tracy, what happens if we don't get these contracts sent? Well, they'd be delayed in getting to the county board, I guess would be the, biggest issue. I'm trying to think of, let me look at what they are specifically. One is cleaning up last year uh, that, and the other one, it wouldn't have an immediate, the immediate impact. And the new contract. Uh, I think they already have somebody there, Forward Home for Boys, Jess. Had done it previously because we used them last year they're already um they they do have a current placement and it's an ongoing placement I don't know that there would be any issue with that placement if it is delayed in any way shape or form so I just won't be able to write a contract is what I'm getting at Jess I have to have that approval before I can send it so they don't have anything in writing for yeah. 2022 from, from the placements perspective they're probably trusting us to that we will get that and I think from our, our perspective, I would say, you know, we oftentimes have to go forward with um, utilizing a provider before we have the contract in place. So I, I think we will be okay if we, if we can't do it, but looks like we're gonna be able to. Yeah. Here I am, sort Hi, of. <laughs> Hi, Ingrid. Welcome. All right, we'll get the meeting started. We're gonna just get through what we need to send to county board and then work through what we can. And you just let us know when you need to go. Okay, thanks. Yep, so I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Um, Tracy, was the agenda properly posted? And Yes, it was. All of that, okay. Great, number two, approval of the January 13th um, board minutes. I'll need a motion for that. I move to approve. Second. Okay, so motion by Dr. Barris, second by Tim Gottschall. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, um, number three, citizen comments. I'm gonna open that up just really briefly. Are there any citizen comments today? Okay, if not, then I guess we'll move down. We're gonna jump down to number eight and then number nine, and then we'll come back up. So number eight, 2021 contract monitoring report. Oh, if I took myself off mute first, this should really, uh, we should go really fast through this. There's only the couple issues that I see. Um, so I'm looking for anything on the far right-hand side that utilization is over 100% because 
most invoices we received are through December. So page one looks just fine. Page two looks just fine. Page three, just about right in the middle is where that premier financial management services is located. Uh, it's well over the approved contact contract dollar amount for 2021. So we do have that on uh, for County Board next Tuesday, as well as that's why we've also increased it for 2022 is it's trending really um, well over 100 to, to 200,000 actually every year. So that's on there. Page four looks fine. Page five looks fine. Six, no issues. And seven's just one little one and it's all fine. So that's all I have for today. And then next month I'll be um, prepping for the 2022 contract monitoring report and giving you more of an idea what, what's out already out there already for those contracts. All right, thank you. So that means we'll move to number nine, approve contracts, agreements, and amendments. Yeah, so then we go straight into that. There's a, a um, revised sheet that I put in there yesterday. So if you looked the day before, you wouldn't see Forward Home for Boys, but I did add that yesterday. So the top one is that Premier Financial Management Services I just spoke on behalf of increasing that again. Uh, so we've had two contract amendments already going down to 210,000 that We'll have to go to county board. I don't know if, I think I saw, I can't see now, but I think I saw Lori Cooey on here and this would be her, um, we have the one for 2021 and the one for 2022. I don't know if she has anything more or can answer any questions on that provider. I would just add it really quick, sorry, I can't see if Lori unmuted or not, but yeah, that's our fiscal agent. Um, for in-home services that um, parents use for children with disabilities, parents and families use. So we would need two separate approvals, one for the 2021 amendment, that's on a separate resolution going to county board, and then the 2022 amended a separate, and then also the new one at the bottom that um, we've talked about a little bit, but just to help you, Ingrid. Madam Chair, do you want us to cover all the contracts before you act or do you um, want So the top two will need a separate motion, correct? All three will need separate oh, because okay. they're all three. Yeah, and I had to do three separate resolutions for each one. Okay, um, so I'll take a motion then for this top one for 2021. So I will move. Okay, so we've got it's a motion by Gottschall, second by Chicker. Chicker. Yep. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> okay, then the 2022 amended contract, I need a motion for that. I'll move. I can make okay, Dr. Barris, I'll second. Um, all those in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. And then um, this third one, is this a, did you say this is a new placement? It's not a new placement. It's a carryover from 2021, but we did not get approval for continuing it into 2022. So I have not uh, issued this contract yet. So once we get county board approval, then I can send that out, but the child is still there. Okay, I thought it sounded familiar. Why did we not get approval already? I'm just curious. I think Jess just missed so, it. Jess, you can speak. Yeah. Yeah, we I think we, we placed at the end of last year. So I okay. failed to do the 2022 contract. It came to my attention as we were working through things in the past two weeks. And I was like, hey, did I submit that one? Thought I did, but it was because the 2021 one was submitted at the end of the year. Um, I just, it was one that I missed in our contract um, requests. Okay, no problem. So I'll take a motion then for this contract. So moved. All right, and a second. I will second, Cindy. Chicker. Motion by Gatchel and second by Chicker. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, so, um, Director Tracy, would you like to go back up to agenda item number four and give us your report? Sure.
All right. Uh, so this is the time of year that uh, staff are working to close out the previous year while continuing to provide services and programs to the community. So over the next several weeks, and it's already started, staff will be completing all of our uh, financial revenue claiming and billing, as well as submitting final reports on programs to the state. And we are just beginning now to uh, compile our 2021 annual report, which will be presented to you in May so that all of that work is taking place. In uh, behavioral health services, uh, treatment services using the evidence-based matrix model are being planned for the new drug court, which is expected to be fully operating this spring. Uh, behavioral health staff are also working to use certain features of our electronic health record system, Cario, uh, by moving to electronic billing records and fewer scanned in paper documents. Uh, this phase of implementation is expected to be completed in April and will save significant staff time. For child and youth services, there are a lot of staffing transitions that will be occurring over the coming weeks uh, that will impact our services and caseloads. Um, staff transitions include our newest worker, Marge McGraw, uh, joining the team and beginning her mandatory training. Our newer workers, Shelby Miller and Emily Phelps, uh, finishing up key training so that they can take on more responsibilities. Uh, veteran worker, Brittany Wirtz, uh, returning from her maternity leave to resume her place on the team. And our most senior worker, Brady Donahoe, uh, stepping into a supervisor role in the unit. Um, our youth aides uh, worker, Eric Ives, and family preservation worker, Cecilia Dagenhart, are continuing to provide their support services to families and youth in the midst of all of the transition that's occurring. For economic support, uh, the COVID-19 Emergency Unwinding Partner Toolkit was introduced by the state. Uh, the purpose is to keep benefit recipients informed of the coming changes uh, in anticipation of the public health emergency ending at some point in 2022, the state's preparing to unwind the special rules and resume the renewal process that was in place prior to COVID-19. At this point, the federal emergency remains in effect and we don't know when it will end. Uh, it was renewed in January, but when the emergency end date is announced, information will be mailed out to benefit recipients uh, that they will need to watch for, review and act upon. Our staff are currently working to assure that we have correct contact information for the members so that they will get uh, those instructional mailings. In the ADRC, uh, we're working with local stakeholders to start uh, the Richland County Care Coalition uh, to address care needs within the community. This coalition will include local nursing homes, managed care organizations, the hospital, and the ADRC. And then once again, the ADRC has participated in the Richland County Homeless Point in Time Count, which took place on January 26th. Uh, assisting with this count helps us to provide needed data for Southwest CAP to apply for homelessness prevention grants that are used in Richland Grant and Iowa counties. Uh, these funds assist with rapid rehousing, motel vouchers, and uh, prevention of homelessness. And then the regional ADRC provided our office with the return on investment calculation for 2021. So this shows the savings created to individuals and to systems and services as a result of the assistance that's provided by our ADRC. The total cost of ADRC specific services in 2021 was $363,658. And the savings created by our Richland County office was over $2 million. So this means that for every dollar spent providing ADRC services to the community, uh, 
individuals in our community. Uh, there was a net savings of $4.56. Uh, this is more than the state average savings of $2.39 for every dollar spent. And that is my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Tracy. Does anybody have any questions for her? All right, if not, I was wondering if you would mind if, um, while you're still speaking, if you don't mind jumping to number 11, I don't know if you had, that's the retention plan update. I yeah. didn't know if there was something we actually needed to make a motion, I doubt, but I, the reason why I'd like to cover that is because I know they talked about it at finance and personnel and I couldn't make it to the whole meeting and I didn't really quite understand where it ended up and sure. um, the minutes aren't out there yet. So if you would give us an update, that'd be great. You bet. Um, so as, as you recall that uh, this board approved last month for a retention incentive plan, um, you had approved that our recommendation for a dollar an hour premium pay and establishing a policy on cost of living updates and step advancement for the wage scale should be forwarded on to both the county administrator and the finance and personnel committee. Um, the proposal was taken to the committee last week and they approved a motion to develop and adopt a comprehensive plan that includes annually making cost of living updates to the wage scale and outlining a wage step advancement policy for county employees based on longevity. Um, the proposal for premium pay was not approved. Uh, they also did not approve giving uh, department heads some additional flexibility with placement of employees on the wage scale. But just prior to uh, voting on the health and human services proposal, the county administrator gave an overview of compensation benefits and retention of county employees, uh, which I think may have influenced uh, the, the vote on our proposal because he's uh, expecting to do some additional things to try to work on retention. So he reported that in 2021, there were 137 terminations in the county countywide, uh, reflecting that the county's overall, our, excuse me, Richland County overall is experiencing similar turnover uh, concerns to what uh, we've reported here at Health and Human Services. So even with the recent pay increase of 7% for general employees and 9% for Pine Valley employees, retention continues to be a concern. Um, the county administrator outlined his plan to review options for addressing these concerns. So Administrator Langrick stated that in February, the current employee benefits package will be reviewed and a survey will be conducted countywide uh, with employees to gather preferences and priorities regarding compensations, benefits, and paid time off that would encourage retention. And then in March, uh, the previous commitment uh, that was made by, I think, the Finance Committee to include wage progression on the wage scale uh, in order to reach market value, along with a discussion on considering for uh, cost of living adjustments to the wage scale will be reviewed. And then Administrator Langrick stated that it is also his plan in March uh, to review the consideration of the county's health insurance package and uh, movement to the health, uh, the state health plan, uh, as well as to review paid time off accrual rates. So I think there's some things that will be happening sooner rather than later uh, with um, hopefully action being taken uh, that goes on to the county board level for approval. Um, so I think there was a feeling that yes, this is a concern. And I think uh, the timing of the administrator kind of having a plan um, really meant that they did not want to go forward with something specific just to health and human services. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, the one, the part that they did approve, um, this was a question that came up at other departments was, that um, resolution where they're looking at the wage scale and the step increases, was that for across the board on the county? That was not specific to HHS, correct? No, not, not at all specific. Okay, 
HHS. That had been my impression. I just wanted to confirm with somebody who was there. So, okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments on that? Uh, Tracy, do you know, are the county employees made aware that there's an ongoing plan to review benefits? Um, you know, all, the only way that I would see that communication happening is through department heads, uh, only because we don't have a like a countywide communication system um, or uh, by county um, employees reading the minutes. But if they didn't know it was on the agenda, they might not know to look in the minutes for that. And like Ingrid said, I think those minutes are out there now, um, but uh, that that would be the only way I would see that they would know. You know, we have a all agency meeting once a month, and I try to share news like that with our employees. But I don't know how it gets communicated in other areas. Okay. Um, anything else, Tracy? I know in the past we've talked about um, you're marking some of the emergency funding that the county still has retained to help with some of this did they um did the committee anecdotally say what we're saving that money for or why this wouldn't be an appropriate use um the i think one of the concerns was so that that uh premium pay idea they could use ARPA funds for that. And uh, we have learned, I think I probably mentioned it at our last month's meeting that those ARPA funds can be utilized across the board for whatever the county feels is needed because of the amount that the county received. I think because our proposal was focused on giving health and human services employees premium pay, but not countywide, there was a comment made that they didn't want to focus just on our department. Um, I don't know if there would be thought that that money might be utilized to, um, if they do make some adjustments this year. Now, this is me speculating, so uh, it's, I'm trying to read between the lines. Uh, if they were able to uh, make changes this year for a cost of living increase and then uh, bringing people up to market, those funds might be considered for something like that because nothing is budgeted for that at this point. And then of course the challenge would be to budget for it uh, for next year. Okay. Is it a truest, uh, maybe this is, if this is an inappropriate question, um, please let me know. Uh, isn't it safe to assume that Pine Valley was was a one-time exception for the use of this, this funding? I would say yes. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I understood that, that there wasn't any, that wasn't specifically tied to Medicare or anything like that. It was I, the same funding. I was under the impression that it was tied to Medicare, that there were some funding that was, because I asked the same, a similar question at a different meeting. And the response I got was that there was funding that was intended to be used for employee wage increases. That was earmarked for them, but I don't know. <laughs> Madam Chair, I think you're right about that. There were two things that Pine Valley did. One was uh, provide a premium pay that went retroactive, and the other was to move all of the staff up one step on the wage scale. I think one of those was partially funded by the additional funding that nursing homes are receiving. So that was really specific to Pine Valley. Right. And I think that the, if, if I recall correctly, one of those, it might've been the premium pay was tied to the ARPA funds that, um, that uh, Supervisor Gotchel is referencing. Great, thank you. Okay, anything else on that? All right, um, well, we'll probably be seeing that then come to county board next week. Um, so I guess we can just move back up and, and go down unless there was something specific you would like us to hit, Director Tracy. Uh, I, I guess if, uh, if our, uh, if Cindy needs to leave by 1130, one of the things, uh, most things are available to you in writing, but I know that 
our uh, CLTS and Birth to Three program was going to give a presentation. And we have all of those staff present here. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we might go forward with that. Sure, definitely. So that would be agenda item number 13. And I'm turning the, the screen over to Miranda, who I think will put a presentation up. Okay, great. Um, so I have with me today, Lori Cooley is our CLTS and birth to three supervisor as well as a service facilitator and social worker. And Emily Shelton is a CLTS and birth to three social worker and facilitator. Um, so we just wanted to spend a little time today um, discussing, um, just taking a, a closer look at our Brick to Three and Children's Long-Term Support programs. Um, you know, I mentioned them pretty often when we're going through contracts and different things. Um, and so um, please jump in with any questions today and then Lori and Emily, um, feel free to jump in as I go through the slides. So just a little history on Birth to Three services. Um, Birth to Three programming serves children between the ages of zero and three years of age. Um, these children have to have developmental delays or other delays. And Birth to Three was developed in Wisconsin in 1988 and in the United States in 1977. And actually the model originated in Hawaii. Um, birth to Three services focus on children's basic needs to include affection, nurturing, and security first. Um, we all know children's best resource is their family. And it, into, it focuses on integration of children with delays or disabilities with other children um, and in their natural environment. And in the last um, 10 to 12 years or so, Wisconsin has really focused on the coaching model. So birth to three teams are made up of a service facilitator. And then those key players, um, either speech, occupational, or physical therapists, or sometimes all those therapy members, um, and a parent educator whenever possible, to focus on um, meeting those developmental needs and um, getting away from those developmental delays to get children um, as close as possible to the baseline of um, their age appropriate functioning. I'm um, just a little bit more on coaching. Um, coaching um, allows the team members to give parents tools to work with the children in the home um, throughout their weeks um, to try to bring them again closer to that baseline developmental phase of functioning. And between the ages of zero and three, the foundation for a healthy developmental future is set more than at any other age. So it's well known that our brains go, grow faster um, between those zero and three ages, forming more than one million new neural connections every second. And we know when babies have nurturing relationships, early learning experiences, and good health and nutrition, those connections are maximized. And so I will sometimes say birth to three is our um, really most crucial program, but of course we know people can make changes at all phases of life. But if um, we allow infants and toddlers to develop to their fullest capacity in those first three years, then people are able to meet their fullest potential in life. And so this is the part where Lori and Emily really take the lead um, on birth to three case management. So I just wanted to briefly touch on, um, and it probably doesn't do justice to the full detail of the work that they do and the work that families do initially, but it's kind of talking through the process. Um, the referral is received and um, as soon as staff get that referral, they have 45 days to either um, work with the family to determine that the child is eligible for services and have a service plan in place, or determine that the child doesn't meet those services, but maybe there's other resources or other services out there that would meet that child's need. Um, initial contact is made with the family, records are received, program paperwork is reviewed and signed, 
Um, and then the primary therapist is assigned to the team through that kind of coaching model, either the speech, occupational, or physical therapist is the primary therapist going into the family home or meeting with families. Um, once families are enrolled in services, then there's monthly check-in meetings or more frequently if um, there's changes or needs, needed changes on the plan. And then there's monthly provider team meetings to just make sure that we're um, meeting all the goals for the families and doing the best work possible for them. Plans are reviewed every six months. And then as children near the age of three, um, they'll be either transitioned onto early childhood programming in the school district or other community supports as appropriate. If you can see my screen, um, just kind of looking at the number of referrals, the referrals are on the left in the gray, and then the number of clients served by year are on the right in the green. And it's really important to note that um, 2021 was a pretty high year for the number of referrals. So 63 referrals and 45 youth served. I was looking at that number with staff and said, well, it's just really similar to 2017. What's the difference? Um, the big difference is um, back in 2017 and before that, we had three service facilitators or staff serving those programs. Um, and we, um, one of those staff was a service facilitator slash birth to three educator. Um, when that staff transitioned out and left that position, um, we had looked at refilling it last year, um, just with the staffing shortages, um, we looked at refilling it part-time. And um, given that it's such a specialty, the birth to three educator and the education needed for that, um, we had one applicant, um, and it wasn't really a great fit for that person. So they declined the position. So, so um, we'll be moving forward, um, looking at considerations for options um, with Director Thorson and um, Stephanie um, and possibly the county administrator at um, perhaps future options for <clears throat> refilling that position. Um, as you can see, we had higher numbers in 2021 and 2020 um, for number of refills. I'm sorry, 2021 and then 2017 for a number of referrals. And then our caseloads are quite high in that program. So just moving on to the Children's Long-Term Support Programming or CLTS programming. CLTS is a home and community-based waiver that funds community supports and services who have substantial limitations in their daily activities, and we want them to remain in their own home or the community. Eligible children um, include children with developmental disabilities, severe emotional disturbances, and physical disabilities. And funding can support children in a range of services, all the way from um, actual items to um, caregivers and respite to keep the children in the community. Um, CCAP, our Children's Community Options Program, is another program that we work with with children with disabilities. And the intention for this program is to better support, nurture, and facilitate, again, um, giving those resources for children to stay in the community. Um, yes. Um, and CCAP serves children under the, um, excuse me. Maybe um, Lori can, Lori, can you take over from here? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> So CLTS and CCAP, we serve kids under the age of 22 if they have an eligible disability and they meet the functional screen requirements. And they also need to live in an eligible setting. I think Miranda, could you change the next slide though? And then, so as case managers or support service facilitators for this program, when we receive a referral, we have 45 days to enroll um, the child in services. At the day one of the referral, we have 10 days to schedule the initial visit. 
and the initial visit, we meet with the family, go over the program, program paperwork, and then we obtain information to determine functional and financial eligibility, which again, we have to do in 45 days, and then we need to enroll the child. And then from there, we finalize a service plan within 60 days of enrollment, and we have monthly ongoing case management. Plans are reviewed every six months or as needed. And then we always have to complete an annual recertification too, which will confirm, verify functional and financial eligibility for the programs. Here are our numbers for the youth and families we served in waiver and CCOP. And you can see from 15 going forward that our numbers have also increased here. And then here's just some things to consider um, when looking at, I guess, our best practices for the programs and looking at the size of the families we are currently serving. So um, the current caseloads for birth to three and CLTS have averaged about 46 for the two service coordinators. And this is a high average for caseloads throughout the state. Most counties having between 25 and 40 per case manager. Higher caseloads are reducing our time spent in finding and providing optimal services for clients. The higher caseloads are also um, increasing the risk of not meeting our enrollment timelines. Lower caseloads would allow for staff to ensure that billing for services is, are ma is maximized. The higher caseload is also having issues with us providing social emotional tools that are required for the birth to three program. The birth to three program is really focusing on social emotional for the families and children that we are serving. Higher caseloads are also reducing staff time for supervision and is limiting supervision. And then increased caseloads do not allow for time efficient knowledge of program updates and state standards. And then child find activities are also reduced. In the birth to three program, we are required to do child find activities. So we try to um, inform the community of the birth to three program. And I believe is that. Um, yeah, that's, that's the last slide. slide. Thanks, Larry. Yes, yeah, so yeah. if you have any questions. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Thank Madam, you guys for putting that together. That was really informative. Madam Chair, if I if I may, just kind of the one of the reasons that we're bringing this presentation to you is we recognize that uh, the both the birth to three program and CLTS is managed by only two staff. Um, previously, there were three, which probably made the program much more manageable. And we're recognizing that we're reaching the limits of our um, capacity for those two staff. Well, we've already reached it as, as you may surmise. And so we're looking at solutions and we wanna keep the board informed about uh, this as an issue because as we identify what we think will be solutions, we'll probably be coming back and talking to you more about it. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. All right, Cindy, how are you doing on time? Actually, I'm in my car driving. <laughs> okay, well, I'm on hands free. All right, so perhaps we should um, maybe adjourn then, unless there's anything else that was pressing to go over. Madam Chair, maybe not quite so pressing, but maybe just a. Uh, uh, item number 12 on the health and yeah. human services board resignation. I could share what that yes, agenda item is. Um, so as you know, back in December, the board uh, kind of put on hold that vacancy that we have on the health and human services board, uh, recognizing that uh, Diane Cox, who is a board member, left that position uh, in order to help out the agency. Um, and we have not been able to fill that APS position that Diane is helping with 
Um, and Diane has said that, you know, she hates to see the vacancy remain on the board if we're going to need her help longer. And so she said, you know, I think you should just look to filling it. And so okay. I, reached, I reached out to uh, Supervisor Severson and the county administrator, and they both said, go ahead. Um, I think we should advertise. And so Angie took care of getting the ad out. Um, and I believe next Wednesday is the deadline for the ad. So I just wanted to make sure the board was aware that we are moving forward with that. Um, so those, any applications will go to Clint, our county administrator. And so we'll keep our fingers crossed that we'll see another board member. Okay, that sounds great. That'll help with quorum stuff too. <laughs> okay, thank you for that update. Well. I think um, then we're probably going to just move to adjournment now since Cindy is going to need to get off in just a couple of minutes. So um, I appreciate all the things that are in our folder. We can look at, I think, the rest of them, the budget summary and et cetera. Looks like it was all in the folder. So um, I think that means we adjourn then to what is our second Thursday, March 10th. That's correct. So I would take a motion for an adjournment. I would move to adjourn the meeting. Okay, and a second? Second. Great, so motion by Cindy Chicker, second by Dr. Barris. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you all and thank you again for coming and um, especially those that did the presentation. So have a good day. Thank you.